Well, welcome everyone to um, River Management Roundtable. My name is Risa Shimoda. There are others in our cast here that we'll introduce in a moment, but we really appreciate your attending. And um, this title, it's a, lots of letters here, lots of words, who and what are SOBA and NASBLA, and why is RMS inviting you to meet them? So we're going to be hearing from a few folks, um, two of whom, Nancy Stewart and Taylor Mas Matsko, and um, we'll we'll continue on with a little bit more of an um, introduction. But we were this our uh, three groups were have been speaking more over the course of the last year or two, and it just seems time to help us understand what each group does because they're certainly related. And they're not the same, in case that um, might seem the case for someone who's not terribly familiar. So welcome. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us for an hour today. So I'm going to introduce Angie. Yeah, go ahead, Angie. Hi, everyone. I'm Angie Furman. I'm the River Training Center Coordinator for River Management Society. And like Risa mentioned, thanks for joining us today for our River Management Roundtable. We do River Management Roundtables monthly, usually on the second Tuesday of the month. And these are free and open to everyone. Um, we invite state river managers, planners, water, watershed leads, water trail directors, Partnership Well and Scenic River Leads, Outfitters, Students, uh, Restoration Practitioners, Planners, Engineers, you name it. Um, we probably had that occupation join. And so these are just opportunities for us to get together and share and have some conversation. So thank you for joining us for our roundtable today. Just real quick, as we're going through today, we just like to set some group norms and agreements, and it's really just about respecting one another, um, you know, making space for others to speak, but also asking your questions, respecting differences, uh, contributing to the process, and, uh, you know, just just that simple level of respect. So just keeping keeping that in mind as we're discussing today. Well, um, we're really excited today. We've got some speakers who are going to be sharing today. We've got Nancy Stewart, who's with the SOBA Board of Directors, and I'll have you introduce yourself here in a minute, Nancy. We've also got Taylor Matsko, uh, who's with NASBLA and SOBA Communications and Marketing Director. And then we are also joined today by Hannah Helsby from NASBLA. She's the COO, as well as an executive director of SOBA, and she'll be um, also here to join in on discussion and answer any questions. I think I'm going to pass it over to Nancy. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Nancy, and then you're welcome to take it away. Thanks, Angie. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Nancy Stewart. I work for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources in our Parks and Trails Division, and I work with boating access, fishing piers, and state water trail programs. Um, and so that's my normal job. And then for SOBA, I'm currently serving as the treasurer. Um, and so SOBA stands for States Organization for Boating Access. Let's go to the next slide. And SOBA was formed in 1986 as a nonprofit organization. And it was basically formed by a bunch of state boating access program managers in positions similar to mine who wanted to come together and share information. They really started out by working together in order to just improve how they build boat access sites, how to best ways to get through the acquisition process, designs that worked, um, especially you know the differences between big lakes, um, you know, small lakes, rivers. They worked on, you know, operations, the best operations and maintenance um, procedures and manuals, and just basically how to improve our state programs. And then it was all kind of tied into how to best use, utilize um, what, what's called Sportfish Restoration Fund Dollars or SFR. 
and it's a grant um, through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that feeds these federal dollars into our state programs. So there was a lot of sharing around um, how to make best use of those funds. And then um, a few years later, it was expanded to include um, CVA, which is Clean Vessel Act, and BIG, which is Voting Infrastructure Grant, and I'll talk more about those later. And then, you know, we also um, do a lot with aquatic invasive species and other issues that affect both voting access and those other programs. Next slide. So uh, the people who come to SOBA and, and participate and come to our annual symposium are, are mainly state um, and US territory voting, CVA and big program managers. Um, we also have a lot of representation from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, especially those who work with the grant programs that you know, we work with. We get a lot of boating industrial industry professionals um, like consultants and engineering firms, especially those who are working with boat access, marinas, and CVA. Um, manufacturers and suppliers um, that make things for, um, for you know, boat ramps and, you know, docks and the CVA pump out units, those kinds of things. And then anybody else who's interested in those aspects of recreational boating facilities. Uh, next slide. And so for many years, SOBA was under um, the National Marine Manufacturers Association for Management Services. And so basically, SOBA is its own organization, but we contracted for management services. But in 2021, we switched that contract to NASBLA. And so that is sort of now why we're, you know, sort of, or are, you know, um, in conjunction with NASBLA on, on many of our things. So NASBLA is helping us with financial management, membership services, um, all sorts of administrative support, definitely the symposium coordination, huge help there. And then any of the newsletters and publications and, and that sort of thing. So really, you know, NASBLA is, is, does the work so that SOBA and all of us state members on the board can focus more on our regular jobs and just do what we need to do to keep, um, to keep SOBA going. Okay, next slide. So we have a new mission and vision statement. So the mission of SOBA is we are the voice of our state and territory members on public recreational boating access. And then our vision is that the state's organization for boating access will foster collaboration among members and be a recognized advocate for recreational boating programs that provide public access and other boating amenities. So just very, very simply stating, you know, our mission and vision and, and focusing our, um, our direction. And we, we just did a whole new strategic plan. So we're super excited to um, have a really solid direction that we're moving forward. Next slide. So here's a little bit more on the a Sport Fish Restoration and Boating Trust Fund if uh, people on the, the call here are not familiar with it. So the Sport Fish Restoration Act was passed in 1950 and sometimes you'll hear it referred to um, for the legislators who, who um, submitted it, so Dingle Johnson. Um, and so that a lot of people are really familiar with the Sport Fish Act. In 1984 is when the Wallet Bro Amendment took place. And that's where we started to capture the motorboat fuel excise taxes. And then that amendment um, mandated that 10% of the funds were spent on boating access projects. So the Sport Fish funds were for fishing projects and habitat. And in 1984, it started to have these federal funds to come to boating. And so you can kind of see with SOBA forming in 1986, how that really influenced the formation of SOBA. And then just over the years, the 1992 amendment increased that allocation to 12.5%. And it gave us five years to spend that federal money um, with the uh, 
with the fishing side, I believe they only have one year to spend the money. So because boating access projects take longer, um, there's five years to spend, which is which was very necessary. And then in 1998, it was reauthorized. And then that was, it was increased to 15% on boating access projects. And the reason um, is because that motorboat fuel tax pays in quite a bit into that fund. Um, it was renamed in 2005 to the Sport Fish Restoration and Boating Trust Fund. And then um, in 2021, it was put in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And so that's more of like the roads and bridges um, funding, which is, I think, a really good place for it. And it's currently funded through 2026. So this is obviously something that SOBA keeps an eye on. Um, we're always very interested in the, um, the reauthorization of our voting trust fund. Um, the chart is just shows the cycle of how it works. You know, the anglers and boaters are paying into the fund because there's certain things that go into it. And then that gets pushed back into the state fish and wildlife agencies and we spend it on things that improve um, fishing and boating. So it, it just keeps the cycle going round and round. Okay, next slide. So working with recreational boating access and the things that are eligible um, with those federal dollars is acquiring land for new boating access facilities and then designing and building those boating access facilities. And then probably a big uh, piece of what a lot of states are doing now is renovating and improving existing facilities that um, you know, were put in you know, maybe in the 80s or 90s when these funds were new and now need to be um, updated and rehabilitated. Um, and then, you know, we can use the funds for other things like conducting surveys um, uh, that have to deal with the adequacy, number, location, and quality of facilities. So that those are the things we work on. And next slide. Okay, now a little more on the Clean Vessel Act. So this is also part of that sport fish restoration funds. And so this is like another slice of the pie. And the Clean Vessel Act um, started in, the, the grant fund started in 1992. Um, it's a five year federal grant program and it, it provided 40 million out of this aquatic resources and trust fund. And then, um, and so that was for five years and then it was amended again. And so um, then we got 10 millions for each fiscal year for CVA. And then, you know, so it just keeps improving every time, you know, it goes through the reauthorization process. Um, then they change it to get 2% of the fund. And now in 2021, it's combined a 4% of the fund uh, with CVA and big together. And what, you know, what does CVA do? The, the things it purchases are the uh, pump outs. So it's a, there's a unit shown in the picture. So it's where a boat can, can pull out, pull up to it, and they can pump out their waste um, reception facility, their sewage from their boat. And so the whole point of the program is to keep that human waste out of the waterways. So there's also, dump outs and that's something where somebody had like a, a portable unit on their boat, they could just lift it up and, and dump it into a facility. Um, eligible now are floating restrooms. And then also there are pump out boats. So instead of the boater going to the unit, the pump out boat goes around the marina and goes to all the boats to pump out their sewage. So the program has definitely grown. And also with this is um, a lot of work has spent, like our dollars are spent advertising and getting people to use the pump outs and know where they are um, and uh, educating people on how important this is. Okay, next oh, slide. Oops, sorry. That's okay. So then we have the boating infrastructure grant, which we call BIG. Um, 
was established in 1998 uh, with $8 million. And then again was reauthorized, um, changed that distrib distribution to 2%. And now currently it's allocated, you know, both CBA and big at 4%. Um, and the purpose of the big program is to construct, renovate, and maintain boating infrastructure facilities. And it's very specific. It's for transient boats. They have to be at least 26 feet long and, and transient means they're staying for 15 days or less. So it's very, you know, very specific, but um, really good purpose to fund um, docks and facilities for boats that are moving around. Um, there's two tiers. Tier one is non-competitive, provides 200,000 per year to each state. And then tier two is, and I think that's going up to $300,000 per year now. Um, and then tier two is competitive and it provides 1.5 million per projects. And they're competitively ranked at the national level. So it's, this is a, this is a much more competitive program, but it provides really good dollars for um, transient boat dockage and other facilities. So, okay, next one. So as far as SOBAs goes, what we're working on right now is, like I said, we just completed our new strategic plan. We're hoping to do some updates to our design handbook. Um, we wanna add accessibility examples, non-motorized access examples, and just refresh the pictures. We, every year we go through annual symposium planning and I'll have a slide on that in a minute. We're starting to coordinate with partner with a pair with, which is a program within the US Fish and Wildlife Service, kind of showing how those dollars um, um, work with partners who pay into the fund and then what we do to get the people using the facilities we built. So it's a great way to sort of connect industry, state agencies and users all together. Uh, we're working on updating our website and uh, part of that is we're creating an online discussion forum. If um, any of you are familiar with NASBA's version, it's NASBA Connect. So those are kind of our main things right now, super excited. Next one. And then these are some of the publications and resources that SOBA has put out over the years. So one of the more popular ones is we have this applicant's guide to the boating infrastructure grant program that walks you through um, how to write a good grant. It's very important because it is complicated. We have an operations and maintenance guideline. We have a design handbook. Um, we have um, some advice on how to construct access sites that will provide areas for AIS prevention. And then we have some techniques for putting in boat ramps. So um, those are available on our website. And next slide. And then we're really excited. Um, our 2023 symposium is gonna be in Tacoma, Washington. And there's more information about this on the SOBA website. Um, it's August 28th through the 31st. And um, it's, yeah, it's gonna be really great. I think I got one more slide on it. Next one. Oh, yep, this one. Um, we do have an education fund. Um, so we established this in memory of Nick. And so basically we hold a silent action, uh, auction or raffle or do something. And those proceeds go to help this fund. And it's designed to help people attend the symposium and, and helping cover costs if you don't have it from your, your state or agency or whatever. And so it's something that people can apply for if they wanna come to the conference, but maybe can't um, cover all the costs. So just something you just can get in contact with is about if you're interested. And then next slide. This is just a really basic schedule. Um, but on Monday, we do have a federal updates and a training workshop. And, um, and so that's a lot related with all of the grant programs. 
and then we have an opening reception and then on Tuesday we do industry partner updates and then get into breakout sessions and then Wednesday is more breakout sessions and then in the evening there's an awards banquet and Thursday we have a field trip where we go out and we see boating access projects we see we go to different access sites um, we'll go to marinas and we'll see uh, CBA um, um, projects and we'll see big projects as well so it's very fun next slide And then this is just a little bit about the awards we give. Uh, the, we have some individual awards. So the Ivers Award is like the, the highest level individual award. And then we do professional service, outstanding service and special recognition. And then we do project awards. And so there's outstanding projects. And then sometimes there's a president's award which is sort of the best of the best. And then we give a state program excellence award and sometimes we'll do a congressional award um, for different representatives, senators, representatives. So, so those are awards and we're always looking for people to, you know, um, nominate individuals or projects for these awards. Uh, next slide. Here's a quick introduction to our board of directors. So Mike is from Vermont, he's the president. Todd from Alabama is the vice president. And you can see me from Minnesota as the treasurer. Preston Smith is our past president and he's from Virginia. Uh, Chris French is a member at large, he's from Ohio. Sharon Clark from Idaho. And Catherine Bukowski-Smith is from Washington. And then Hannah Helsby, she can maybe come on and wave quick. Um, she's our executive director and she's based with NASLA. So there she is. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we've got a great group of people. We try to have um, representation from around the country so that we all can provide kind of different views and perspectives to bring a good balance to SOBA. And next slide. And then here's the, the website and the phone number and the contact for, um, for SOBA. So I don't know if we want to do any questions. Otherwise, um, you know, we can hand off to the next one. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat. You can also raise your hand and um, we'll be checking that as well. And as questions come up, um, feel free to put them in there and we'll have a little bit of time at the end as well to address any questions. But I am not seeing anything right now. Oh, let's see. You not see slides? No, I'm not seeing any questions. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> we see the slides. So maybe um, we'll pass it over to Taylor. Go ahead and introduce yourself and take it away. Yeah. So um, obviously I'm here today to talk about NASLA. So I'll have you hop to the next slide. My name is Taylor Matsko, and I am the Communications and Marketing Director for NASBLA. And so if you have any questions about NASBLA or anything, I did include my contact information and phone number there. So feel free to reach out to me at any time. Next slide. So first I wanted to just give a general overview and start by talking about who is NASBLA. So um, NASBLA is the National Association of State Boating Law Administrators, <clears throat> and we represent the, 50, the recreational boating authorities in all 56 states and the U.S. Ter the US territories. So we, oh, hang on a second, I just got kicked. Um, okay, can you guys still hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so, like I said, we represent the recreational boating authorities of all 56, st 56 states and the U.S. territories, and many of the SOBA and River Management Society state members 
work with some of the work in some of these agencies or with some of these agencies, or you may partner with their boating safety programs within the agencies. So NASBLA was founded in 1960 after the adoption of the Federal Boating Safety Act of 1958. And we offer a variety of resources um, that I will dig into a little bit later, but some of those are training, model acts, education standards, publications, and more. Next slide. So here is our mission statement. NASBLA is a professional community leading recreational boating safety through innovation and collaboration for excellence in policy development, national standards, and best practices. So we envision a flourishing culture of safe and enjoyable boating for everyone out of the water. And our core values circle around collaboration, collegiality, consensus building, continuous improvement, equality, and stewardship. And so our goal is to move the association forward with professionalism, transparency, integrity, and dedication of purpose. Next slide. So as I mentioned previously, NASBLA offers a variety of resources that might be useful to you or your organization. So I did wanna to touch on a few of these. So we have numerous online boating safety dashboards that cover various topics, including boating education, boating under the influence enforcement, incidents analysis, um, life jackets, paddle sports, registration and titling, state performance data, and more. Uh, these are all available on our website, just as most of these resources are, but I did want to mention some of those because it does have a lot of information that can be specific to your state, and then you can compare and see what it's looking like for other states regarding to some of these topics. Um, we also have a variety of training. Oh, you're good to stay on that one slide. Sorry. We also have a variety of training opportunities available to you. Uh, we have the Certified Recreational Boating Professional Certification, which is a voluntary credential for recreational boating professionals developed by NASBLA. The credential is broad-based and addresses a boating professional's knowledge, performance, and career achievements in the identified program domains, which you can find on the website. And lastly, I wanted to, on this slide, I wanted to mention the NASBLA eLearning Center. Uh, the eLearning Center houses videos and trainings from in-person and virtual events, past webinars, micro-learning videos that we've developed, and more. So if you haven't been in there and you're looking for some free online training or sessions from past conferences and events, you can find those all there. Next slide. So as many of you may already know and be familiar with, NASBLA in partnership with the River Management Society and a variety of other organizations launched the third edition of a guide for multiple use water day management. Um, I believe I saw Pam on here earlier and Risa I know is here. Um, they were the authors of this wonderful document. And so the guide supports the reduction of recreational boating fatalities and injuries through improved understanding of and accessibility to tools needed to implement sound management processes on shared recreational waters, including the intersection of commercial traffic and recreational users. This guide provides direction for effective waterway management, including policy development and communication for public understanding, acceptance, and compliance. This resource um, has been published and on the slides I have here, you can um, download the free PDF online, which is the full guide, and you can just have that as a file on your computer. But if you are more of a hard copy person, you are able to print an on-demand copy on the website. So I included that link there if you are interested in downloading or ordering a hard copy of this document. Next slide. So since its first meeting in 1960, NASBLA has developed a wide range of recreational boating safety public policy. We have created a library of model acts which focus on boat operation, education, numbering and titling, personal safety, and more. Um, like I already mentioned earlier, I mentioned the e-learning center, but we also have NASBLA Connect, which Nancy mentioned that SOBA is working on something similar to this. But what NASBLA Connect is, it's an expansive online community for the recreational boating safety community. So the NASBLA Roundtable, which is our largest community within Connect, 
It's an open community to all who are involved with NASBLA and the recreational boating safety community. And it houses discussions and resources that have been shared among the members within this community. So we have a lot of discussion that happens here. Questions if people are looking for more information or if they're looking for resources, if they're looking to see what other states are doing, trends that they're seeing throughout their own state. Um, NASBLA also maintains an expansive public library of useful graphics and information for anyone to access. And this is also in NASBLA Connect. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we do have education standards and research on that as well. And all of these resources that I've mentioned can be found on the NASBLA website. And that's a screenshot of our website right there. So if you're looking for any of this, you can find all of that there. Next slide. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about our policy committees. NASBLA employ, employs a committee structure to identify issue and uh, issues and address needs in the recreational boating safety public policy realm. So NASBLA's committee's function is the primary source sounding board and national policy seti, setting forum for each of the significant program areas addressed in the National Recreational Boating Safety Strategic Plan. So these committees develop best management practices, model procedures, model acts, position papers, and other products that they do share. And so as you can see up on the slide, our six policy committees include the Education and Outreach Committee, Enforcement and Training, Engineering, Reporting and Analysis, Paddle Sports, RBS Finance and Grants, and lastly, Vessel Identification, Registration and Titling. So in addition to the state voting agency members that are on the committees, the committees include broad representation from recreational boating professionals throughout the boating industry, the nonprofit sector, international interests, the boating public, and federal and local agencies as well. So if you're interested, you can definitely get involved with our committees. Next slide. So NASBLA's uh, annual conference is also coming up. The 2023 NASBLA annual conference will be taking place in the West this year in Denver, Colorado. Uh, the conference will begin on Tuesday, September 19th with opening ceremonies and the chair's reception. And on Wednesday and Thursday, we will have a variety of breakout and general sessions with the annual awards luncheon taking place Thursday afternoon. Uh, the comp, we will wrap up on Thursday evening with the off-site event, and then the annual business meeting will be held on Friday morning, and that will be September 22nd. So the 2023 annual conference will conclude that Friday at noon, and we would love to see you there. So if you're interested, check out our website, get registered, get a hotel room, because those go quick, um, but we would love to have you. Next slide. So I did want to touch a little bit on, I know there's been a lot of SOBA, NASBLA, I work for both, Hannah works for both, so it can be a little bit confusing. So I wanted to do a quick overview on our association management. So in addition to being its own nonprofit association, NASBLA provides association management services to four organizations. Um, and those four organizations are the Life Jacket Association, the Paddle Sports Trade Coalition, the States Organization for Boating Access, which is SOBA, and the Western States Boating Administrators Association. Um, so we provide support for things like the executive board and governments, membership records, financial management, event planning and support for the symposium, like Nancy mentioned earlier, communications and marketing, and website management and digital assets. So NASBLA is its own entity, but under us, we provide staffing services for these four organizations as well. So that's where kind of the overlap with um, NASBLA and SOBLA comes in. Next slide. So that is everything that I had for the overview of NASBLA today. If you have any questions, I can take them now or later based on however uh, Angie wants to do this, or you can always email me or call me. My phone number was on the first slide. My email's here again, but happy to take any questions. Thanks, Taylor. And again, um, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand or you can put them in the chat. 
couple different ways to, to ask questions. Everyone shy, we could keep going. Oh, it's Matt. Matt has his hand up. No. Go ahead, Matt. Well, I'm happy to wait till later as well, but um, I just wanted to, to thank Nancy and, and Taylor for those excellent uh, presentations and for the River Management Society for um, uh, coming together and, and putting this, um, this very informative and, um, and, and excellent roundtable um, on this topic. Um, uh, I, I guess my... Um, my interest at this point would be just to hear some perspectives from um, uh, from both of you regarding uh, what the outlook is on non motorized access uh, development. Um, uh, on a national level, uh, what are the trends that that you are seeing? Um, from um, NASBLA and, and SOBA to uh, address the, the growing needs for the non-motorized uh, recreational access uh, sectors. And uh, uh, how is that viewed in the, in the context of, of what I imagine is uh, an ongoing uh, uh, area of uh, priorities and needs to be met for maintaining existing accesses as well for uh, standard motorized and peer access, et cetera. Yeah, so I can talk a little bit from the SOBA perspective. Um, the, the funds through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the federal funds that come in and match with our state funds are eligible for non-motorized um, projects standalone or with um, motorized access. So it's definitely something we consider when building boat access sites is, you know, are those non-motorized boaters happy to use the same boat ramps as motorized boats and vice versa? Or is it better for us to come up with ways to separate those uses and provide um, different facilities for both types of uses? Um, and, and, you know, in, in my state, we have a lot of rivers um, with both types of access as well as lakes with both types of access. And so it can really, um, you know, mean that we have to provide a variety of options and facilities for all the different kinds of boaters. So, we do, we talk about non-motorized quite a bit. Um, and, and more and more, um, you know, we're, we're talking about accessible kayak launch docks, um, adding those to sites. It just makes launching easier for all users, you know, especially new people who've never been in a kayak before. It gives them more confidence um, getting on the water and, and just trying to um, serve, serve all voting customers so hope that helps taylor i'm i'm going to take this one for nasbla i'm kind of wearing multiple hats so since nancy uh spoke for so i'm going to take this one for nasbla and um yeah we we continue just like everybody else to see a, a over overturn and overturn on the increase of um, non-motorized in the paddle sports community. So one of the things that NASBLA did a few years ago now was to initiate the paddle sports committee, and that's made up of uh, members of the states, our associate members, and just other members of the recreational boating safety community. And each year they develop new charges that they believe are going to help support um, the states and working with those communities. So um, that's one thing that we really um, put a lot of our focus into is just supporting our policy committees and their work in um, developing resources um, and educational materials, presentations that will help the states work with that community. And then the other thing um, that we do is to continue to review our education standards and just ensure that the voting education courses that we approve, um, that we're um, approving to the standards, um, those standards are 
um, addressing and meeting the, the needs of educating the non-motorized community in those boating safety courses. Excellent. And um, may, maybe a follow-up question to, to that would be, uh, are any of you aware of um, access developments on U.S. wild and scenic rivers? Uh, uh, and uh, just, just as a, a, a final uh, push, maybe, if there are people that are interested in, in, in trying to work with you for improving an access or developing a new access, uh, what, what would be the best recommendation for, uh, uh, for moving that, that forward with either of, of the organizations? The, I think the best um, opportunity to talk about creating new access would be working to the agencies in that state. So SOVA and NASBLA both obviously can put you in direct contact with good contacts um, to, to talk about that in, in whatever state um, you're looking at. So I would say reach out to either of the organizations and just um, explain what state you're trying to get a hold of, and we can try to help um, drive you in the right direction with the right contact. Hi, I have a follow-up from the first question as well. So I was going through both of the organization's websites and it looked like a lot of the educational information was targeting people that have prior experience or just understanding of even like voter safety or just those lived experiences. What resources do other or do either organization have for people that are more the beginner or just looking to get involved in? maybe outdoor sports for motorized and non-motorized, just kind of like an introduct or yeah, like an introductory beginner level educational resources. So I I, told you a lot. <laughs> sorry, what was the last part? I know that's kind of a lot. So if someone from either organization also can't answer to that today, that's okay. Yeah, and if there's anybody else on this call that is familiar with some of the resources that might be good for beginners. Um, it kind of, the first thing that jumps to my mind um, is that uh, through NASLA's committee structure, we have um, some open, we have a call for a solicitation of charges. Uh, charges are the ideas or tasks that our committees work on um, throughout the year. And so uh, SOBA also is developing more uh, committee structure within the organization. And one of the focus, early focuses of that committee structure is to develop resources that can be um, easily accessible, uh, both to the agency as the member and just to the public in general. So I'm not familiar with specific resources that are geared towards beginner um, paddlers. We both organizations try to work with our partners um, to. Uh, I'm not sure what the word is, I'm blanking on the word, but like we try to share resources, uh, kind of co-collaborate on sharing other communities' resources. So if there's anybody on this call that um, is aware of any of those types of resources, I would encourage you to reach out to either organization um, so that we can help kind of fill that void. Um, but also, please, if you have any specific suggestions or see a specific need um, to reach out to both organizations, and maybe that can be something that can be funneled into a committee project. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Again, if you have any other questions, you're welcome to just come off mute or put them into the chat. Matt, go ahead. Well, I, I guess I would, I would uh, ask again, uh, are there any examples about um, uh, river access to, uh, developments on wild and scenic rivers that I think Nancy uh, made a little nod when I asked that earlier, but I'm not sure if that 
uh, that kind of got dropped as as um, as we move forward. But uh, I don't know if that's anything relevant. If there's anything relevant, you might have to to add about some of the considerations or interests for for uh, improving accesses or developing accesses on uh, wild and scenic rivers, which may have additional considerations um, uh, under their the act. Yeah, there certainly is. And honestly, I think RMS <laughs> is the best source of information in dealing with um, wild and scenic rivers. Um, there was a lot of information at the RMS conference um, um, for, for that angle. Um, National Park Service, are they the ones that have all the resources? But um, I think, you know, as far as building a boat access, the principles are pretty much the same with wild and scenic rivers. A lot of times the setbacks and you know what you can do um, around the river just take a lot more permitting. So, um, so I don't know if you need anything more specific than that, but maybe yeah, Angie I, wants, or- I, we, I can jump into Nancy, yeah. um, that the process might be almost the same and it might be quite different depending on if it's new access or remodel their up, updated access. And there are extra steps to go through, but it's not like it can't be done. Um, you know, wild scenic rivers need to protect free flowing of rivers. So if you're, you want to put something in a river and it's essentially um, diminishing the amount that the river is free flowing, then it just has to go through a, an evaluation, a section seven evaluation, but it can be done. It certainly, every wild and scenic river that has a bridge on it or a path on it, because they're not all wilderness rivers, um, it has to get updated. Every time there's an update, it needs to go through the same process. So it's not a, a black and white thing, but there's definitely more protections in place so that you maintain what's there or make it better. Hope that's helpful. Excellent. And yeah. This is great follow up to the um, um, the workshop that that was held recently by RMS for the um, access um, uh, on wild and scenic rivers, and um, there was also the section seven um, uh, section of the uh, wild and scenic rivers uh, training series that that was held, and uh, there was a case study in in that series uh, that. Um, that uh, mentioned a um, um, a um, an emergency situation on the Snake River, which has a uh, um, um, oh, uh, scenic uh, river designation status. And uh, I was curious if uh, uh, if uh, any of you were involved in uh, the response and follow up to. Uh, to addressing the the issues with the um, uh, restoring access and and uh, and and road roadway maintenance in that in that section. I don't think the folks here were, but one of our former board members, Dave Cernicek, was the ranger on the Snake who had to deal with this balancing restoring a river um, from a you know an, a really bad. Um, not avalanche, but you know, a, a closure and um, the needs of the local folks who would otherwise have to drive way, way, way around and spend hours on the road um, going into town and back. So they're definitely balancing um, situations. And in some cases, there, there might be a temporary fix that has to be where, so they're always looking at mitigating the, the effects of a project on the free flow water quality of, of a wild sea river. So and there's a whole study on that if you want, we can send that to you. Um, I'd love to give Angie a little time because we actually had a little time to plug RMS and kind of talk about what our organization does um, before we get to the, and we'll have some more time for questions, but if we could just take another couple of minutes and to kind of round out the, the three organizations, and if you want to go. Yeah, happy to. Um, yeah, we just have a couple quick slides about RMS. Many of you are familiar with RMS, but some of you might not be. So we thought we would just include a little bit um, 
about us. And so our RMS, River Management Society, has the mission of supporting professionals who study, protect, and work on North America's rivers. And we do this through a variety of ways. We have uh, different types of training. We really are encouraging collaboration and professional networking. And then you can see they're inspiring and engaging the next generation of river professionals and managers and stewards. So RMS has its history or its roots in the Interagency Whitewater Committee that was established in 1972. It was essentially some federal river managers that were coming together from different agencies who wanted to find ways to, to work better and address problems that they were all facing that were really similar and didn't, didn't quite know how to address. So we do, um, as I mentioned, we have a bunch of different ways that we do this through networking tools, workshops, river trips, educational resources, and whatnot. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Here is like a very, very probably overly simple breakdown of some of our uh, initiatives and programs and projects, but just some that I wanted to highlight. We have our National Rivers Project, which is a website that uh, has a, well, <laughs> let me restart. We have our National Rivers Project, um, which is a website that has a bunch of data where you can go in and find information about different river stretches, put-ins, takeouts, and logistics, and uh, information associated with those different sites and stretches. We have our National River Recreation Database, which is a database of information. Um, uh, we have James Major on staff, who, who's really the coordinator of those projects. So if you have any questions about those in particular, I encourage you to reach out to james at river-management.org. We also have a certificate program for undergraduate and graduate students. We currently partner with 12 different uh, colleges and universities across the country to offer this certificate in partnership with RMS. We've had, I think we're like over 40 graduates of this certificate at this point, and the program is growing, but it consists of um, coursework, like practical application through some sort of professional work or internship, and then we also have a written or a spoken require presentation requirement, and so that's a really exciting program that's growing and growing. And then we also have the RMS River Training Center, which uh, is where we do a lot of our webinars, workshops, and whatnot. So Risa, if you can go to the next slide. Yeah, this is just a little bit about the RMS River Training Center. I'm the coordinator. So um, we've got our mission there, but the training center was started just in 2018. And it's a way to help support those professionals and volunteers who study, protect, and manage our rivers. And you can see there, we do this through virtual training. We have meetups and roundtables such as this one. We also do in-person workshops of uh, various kinds. We do these throughout the year. Um, sometimes someone comes to us you know, needing with a need and we work with them to create a workshop. We also do various in-person workshops during our symposium. That takes place every other year. Our next one will be in 2025 in Ashland, Oregon. We also do field skills courses. We've done like leave no trace stuff in the past, swift water rescue training for like river rangers. And we do like a river ranger rendezvous uh, every year, getting together river rangers who are dealing with those on the water um, topics and issues and experiences. And then we also have a bunch of on-demand video recordings, and you can find those now on our YouTube channel, where we've got like 150 different videos of various topics. Um, and again, we're, we're trying to reach students, rangers, entry-level professionals, specialists, managers, even like high-up high, high uh, level professionals. So um, just about anyone who works on or around rivers. Next slide. 
Here's just a, a graphic that shows some of the different topics that we deal with currently at the River Training Center. But again, this is always growing and changing. On that left-hand side there, those are all geared towards wild and scenic rivers. So everything from introductory to getting into the bolts of evaluating water resources projects, or also known as Section 7 projects, as we've mentioned a couple times today. Um, we also do workshops and training around writing management plans uh, for wild and scenic rivers. But then over there on the right, you can see some of the other topics that pertain to all rivers, such as river access planning. Um, we've got the river access planning guide available that was created through a group of partners, uh, including the Park Service. And we've got that on our website. Um, We've also, we're doing some training on process-based restoration or uh, restoration that, that takes into account fluvial geomorphology and how to do restoration proper, or, you know, is restoration required in the first place? What kind of restoration is best suited? So we've got some training about that. We're also part of the ADASH collaborative, which deals with um, which stands for Anti-Discrimination and Sexual Harassment. We are involved with them. We've got a training series going on currently that's monthly uh, through November. We've done some training around visual resource management and, and scenic resources and aesthetics. And then, as I mentioned earlier, some uh, training related to river rangers and, and field skills. Next slide. I guess these are just kind of like our final little closeout slides. I can just go through them real quick. And then if we do have any last questions, but um, you might've seen when you came in today that this is being recorded. We are gonna put this onto our YouTube channel as well as email it out to everyone uh, who registered for this. But again, I encourage you to check out that YouTube channel and subscribe so you see new videos as they are posted. And I can put a link to that in the chat. And then just a couple upcoming events that we've got going on. In particular, these are our next ones that we have on the calendar. This is part of our ADASH collaborative webinar series. On August 10th, we're going to be looking at should we be counting the complaints? So thinking about how uh, no complaints about sexual harassment might seem like a good thing, but might not be the case. Um, because you want people to be reporting it. But then all of a sudden, if people start reporting it and you get a bunch of reports, then you're like, oh no, does this look bad? So it's, it's kind of dealing with that um, issue. And then in September, we're going to, we've got a webinar on who's taking me down this river. And Dr. Maria Blevins is gonna be presenting her research about people's notions of, of an idea of who their guide should be as far as uh, like a river guide. And then here, I'm gonna put a link in the chat, but we're always interested to hear uh, feedback from you about our sessions. And so we'd love to hear any comments uh, or questions or anything that you have from today's session. So I'm gonna put this link to the survey in the chat right now and encourage you to all fill it out. And then again, just a, just a huge thank you for everyone for attending. A big thank you to Nancy and Taylor and Hannah for sharing information with us and being here today. And I'll be quiet in case we have any last question or two. And I did see a really good comment from Scott in the chat there. I'd like to, yeah. And We'll stay another minute or two, we're at the time, but please, if you have questions or comments, please let us know. And uh, thank you to our partners, to Hannah and to Taylor and to Nancy for providing information on your awesome organizations. And uh, we hope to be partnering with you a whole bunch in the future because our work aligns and hopefully we'll just support as opposed to just you know competing against each other or something like that. Thank you.
Thank you, Matt, for your questions. Thanks for having us, Risa. Sure, and good luck in uh, in future collaborations. I'm really excited to uh, to see everyone here here together and uh, and see where this will go. Thanks, everyone.